What's up, Metro East? It is um, a great thing, and I'm excited about being here and sharing uh, with you something that's been stirring uh, in my heart for some time now, and it's the vision for this year, uh, 2014. I was planning to share this um, at the beginning of January when snow Mageddon came and uh, uh, we were forced to cancel a service. So I was glad to keep you all warm and safe, but disappointed because really uh, it was something I was looking forward to sharing with you. I wanted to take a few minutes and share uh, what the elders and the leaders of, of the journey feel like the Lord is leading us um, into uh, this year. More specifically, what God is calling um, us to be as a church and really um, us and you to be as individuals. Um, and it's summed up um, by the phrase mobilizing missionaries. Say it with me, mobilizing missionaries. Uh, we want our church, we want our various ministries, and we want every individual that makes up our church uh, to live lives that are centered on mobilizing missionaries this year. Um, if you did not know that um, as a Christian, you're a missionary, I'm a missionary, we're all missionaries. It's not just something uh, that's done in Africa or India or Haiti, um, but right uh, in Belleville, Shiloh, uh, O'Fallon, uh, right in our high schools and junior high schools, um, right at the bank, at the YMCA, at the hospital, at Starbucks. Um, it's something that's happening all around us that as Christians, our call and our mandate is not just to be saved for ourselves, to be saved to be sent out. And so we want our hearts to beat hard for the lost. If you remember, uh, during the Advent series, uh, we talked about one of the, the purposes of Jesus coming. And Jesus said that he came to seek and save the lost. Um, and, as, and we, as his family, as his followers, uh, we want and need to be about the same thing that he is, that uh, we want to be about seeking and saving the lost. And so uh, as we talk about this, this great vision of mobilizing missionaries, we'll under it, uh, uh, address some of the values uh, that we believe will, will stir and equip us to, to live out and fulfill the vision that God has laid uh, before us. And really more importantly, to help us be uh, more faithful uh, followers of Jesus Christ. So we're going to be spending some time in second chapter of first Peter, and that I feel kind of clearly lays out the values that we'll be addressing. So first, let's begin looking at uh, what is considered the, the bedrock, the foundation, or, or better yet, what, what Peter calls the, the cornerstone that everything else rests upon, and that is the gospel. Uh, this value that we're highlighting, it is the most important value. Um, the gospel uh, provides the framework and the foundation that everything else stands upon. And so uh, we're going to spend some time looking at the gospel. And what, is it, what does it mean for for us to live out the gospel, especially in light of mobilizing, uh, being mobilized missionaries. So let's look at uh, verses 3 through 8, 1 Peter chapter 2, and it reads, If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good, as you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves like living stones are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. So first and foremost, what does it mean to be gospel centered? Well, we saw in uh, verse six and seven, uh, he talks about uh, believing, our uh, believing in him. Uh, and, and, and the gospel first and foremost starts with him who is Jesus Christ. He is a central figure of really all things, um, all times, 
all institutions, all people, and the gospel. He is the central figure. The gospel is God through Jesus' life, his death, and his rescue, uh, resurrection, uh, rescuing and restoring us who are rebellious creatures, restoring us to a wonderful relationship with our creator. Uh, it in believing in him, the first B, believe in him, being gospel-centered, uh, this is more than a cognitive uh, belief. This is more than just simply mere rules and rec uh, regulations. Th when we talk about believe, in the Bi when the Bible talks about believing in him and knowing in him, it's, it's referring to a soul-awakening, life-changing acknowledgement of response to and love for what Christ has done. Let me repeat that. It's a soul-awakening, life-changing acknowledgement of response to and love for what Christ has done in Peter takes us one step further in being gospel-centered by calling him a cornerstone. A cornerstone is that stone that, 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 that prov really provides the, the alignment for everything uh, uh, beyond that. So it is the key piece of the foundation and the key piece that aligns the walls that are going up. And so when, when Peter talks about Jesus being the cornerstone, he's refer referring to us building our lives on him. That's the second B of being gospel sin to first believe in him, second, build your life on him. Uh, what Peter and really what the whole scripture is inviting us and challenging us to do is to build our life, our identity, our hopes on Jesus Christ, that everything else rests on him, and he is the key foundational stone. And if the foundation is off, everything off. So what that means is when, when our lives are, are, are aligned with, are set upon, are found, find it grounding on anything else, then everything else that spouts out of that is going to be off. So, so to be gospel center means to, yes, believe in him, but also also build our lives on him. And then third, it means to, to behold him as good and precious. Verses, verse three says, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. And then verse four, it says, as you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. Uh, my concern is that um, we have many who, who, who think about Jesus but don't thirst for Jesus. They, they think about Jesus, but don't treasure Jesus. And the, and the gospel is far more than your cognitive acknowledgement that yes, Jesus died and resurrected for you. But, but do you behold him as good? When it says, a taste it and see that he is good, that's an experiential element of the gospel. And to be gospel-centered is not just to say, yes, I know Jesus died for me and was resurrected for me. And lived a perfect life for me. Uh, it's, it's more than just to wake up in the morning and, and read a couple of verses and go about your way, but really it's a pursuit of treasuring him above all things. Do you treasure him? Um, my prayer is that um, as we continue into this year, uh, that we treasure him more and more. I think one of the hopes that I have um, in the engaged scripture reading plan is to stir our affections for that. There's no treasuring Christ, there's no spiritual growth, and there's no being a, an effective missionary without God's word. And so I want to challenge you to start the engaged scripture plan right now. Like even if you haven't started yet, start today. Don't try to catch up. All right, but, but go to, uh, to what the scripture is for today and start here and then keep on going because the goal is not just to uh, maximize your reading, but to engage the Lord through your reading so that as you read, your affections are stirred, your affections are awakened. I think some of us are just bored with Christ and bored with our walk with the Lord. And I believe that as we engage the scriptures that God would so stir our hearts once again for him and for his glory. And so I do want to invite and challenge you to get involved. You can uh, text Bible to that number on the screen. I use the texting. It texts me every morning at 6 a.m. to get going. I want to invite you to, to dive in. 
Next, the second value that's necessary uh, to be faithful followers and effective missionaries of Jesus is the value of family. Uh, we were made for community. As I, as I often say that we were created to be deeply known and deeply loved. First from God, our creator, and then, uh, and then by his people. Um, and then beyond that, what that means is that we were created to make other people, other people's problems our problem. It says weep with those who weep. That means it shouldn't matter to me what you're going through, good or bad. And we're also to live our lives together. Uh, in verse 5, uh, 1 Peter 2, we read, And you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices accept acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Living stones being built up as a spiritual house. What that means is we are called to be interdependent, not just interconnected or interrelated, but interdependent. Like it's interesting that he calls the stones. Like if you look at a brick building, um, each stone has stones that are resting upon it going up and the stones that it is resting upon going down. And if a stone, if a stone, if, I'm, if this stone begins to shake, then everything else above it begins to shake. And if it comes out, then it makes that wall that much weaker and then it will eventually fall. And then going down, like if, if, if a brick below it begins to shake, then it begins to shake um, and then eventually falls out. Um, if force to. We are called to be connected in such a way. Many of us, we come to church, we get the teaching, and then we rush home. Uh, but, but as a body of believers, as Christians, hear me, as God's family, we are called to be, to, for our lives to be built upon one another. So like if you stop coming to church, if you stop being a part of this community of faith, what things would collapse? Whose lives uh, would be affected by your absence? And if you're not connected with somebody in such a way where your absence will be noticed, your absence would matter, then I would tell you, you're not connecting in the degree that God has invited you to connect. We are meant to be a family. That means if, if you're not in that seat, um, really, it's not even just up to the pastor to notice if you're here or not. It's up to the body of believers to notice um, whether you're here and then how you're doing. Uh, being interdependent means you, we share decisions together. Uh, we share our private struggles. We share our emotions. We share our money, our homes, our resources. We share practical help. We share everything. Um, and, and this community, this family, it's important. First, it's important because we can't fully know God unless we're in deep community. Yes, your relationship with the Lord is a personal relationship, but hear me. It's not a private relationship. It's a communal relationship as well. And so, and, and to know God fully is to engage in such a community. But secondly, community overflows into mission. Remember, our goal this year is to, be, be, to mobilize missionaries. And I think one of the things that, that really position us to do that and that stir our hearts to do that is to be in community, starting looking at the Trinity that existed in community in eternity past and, and poured itself over into creation and to continue to pursue uh, their re the rebellious creatures through, through Jesus Christ being sent and then, and then Jesus sending the Holy Spirit through that community overflowed into mission, the same pattern for us as a community faith, that as we gather in community, community is not the end goal. The com community uh, should spark worship and pour into mission. And that is a goal. If you look at verse 9, when it talks about us being a priesthood, a nation, um, and a chosen race, it then it quickly goes to proclaiming the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Like, as a community of faith, we are to proclaim the excellencies of of those around us. And so the opportunity for us, the initiative, the challenge I have for you is to get 
plugged into a community group. Um, please get plugged in. I plead with you because not just because I need you to, but you need you to. Um, uh, the, the, the life, the joy that I experience as I'm being shepherded, I am not a community group leader. Someone else leads and shepherds me in their community group. Um, and it is a huge part of my week. Yes, I'm tired and busy. Some weeks I'm thinking, man, do, should I go this week? But I'm there. You know why? Because I need it. And and then they need me to be a part of that. So get plugged in uh, to community group or some form of community. You can do that through serving, but please get connected, get interdependent upon one another. Next, we must uh, realize that we're all servants. That as we seek to be better missionaries, we're not solely concerned about the loss, but also concerned about the church. That as servants, uh, we don't just come to church, we invest in church. Uh, verse 9, it reads, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood. I'm going to stop there. A royal priesthood. Now there's a lot of uh, application, the implication of being a priesthood, but really to sum it up, um, the priesthood is a group set aside to minister to God and minister to each other. So what's clear in this verse is that we're all priests, not just me, the pastor, not just community group leaders or, or ministry leaders, but everyone in here, if you are a Christian, you're a priest and you're a minister, all right? And so you have a part to play in this church. God has given you abilities, gifts, experiences, your education to benefit and pour into the rest of us. My concern is we live in a time where we're prone to think more of um, how can you better serve me? What can I get? And so you got people who, who run a church to church and saying, well, they didn't feed me and that wasn't for me. And you got people who go to multiple churches because this church gave me this piece and that church gives me that piece. That's actually not the proper mindset. The proper mindset is to, is to look, plant and invest yourself in a body of faith, all right? Pour yourself and invest yourself in the people in that body of faith, in that vision. Because this is, man, this is the picture of Jesus, is it not? Like Jesus um, didn't wait for us to fix ourselves, didn't wait for us to become the beautiful, cleaned up people, but yet came despite how messy we were. He didn't wait for us to, to be able to serve him, but yet came, gave, and served us despite how messy, broken, rebellious we were. Jesus said, I'm going to serve you. That's the heart of a Christian, that you need to, if you are coming to the Journey Metro East, um, I invite and encourage you to get plugged in. If this is not the church for you, then go to the church that's for you, but invest in that place. And please don't go to multiple places complaining about what church do or don't do for you, but find the church that you can pour into and then help them become the beautiful bride that they were called to be because we're called to be servants and not just serve one another, but as we're serve, serving one another, John 15 says that it's our love for one another that the world will then see and, and acknowledge and see the, the beauty of the gospel. Um, and so our serving one another is, is, again, not just simply to end on ourselves, but it's another thing, another value, another instrument that God uses for, for his glory and the good of those even outside of the church. So find out where you can invest in this church. We have many opportunities from Journey Kids to running sound, uh, to, to, to greeting people as they come in. But I invite and encourage you to plug in somewhere. I don't care how big or how small you think it is. I don't care if you think you're too broken, messed up to plug in. No, you can plug in right now. So please do so. But it's important that we realize that we don't do this on our own in any way, in our own strength, um, in our own power, but we do this under the power of the Holy Spirit. And that brings us to our next value, which is being spirit-led. In verse 5, he says, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house. We're not just being built up as a house, as a building, but a spiritual house. That points to, look, 
we can't do this on our own. We're never called or created to do this on our own. You can't get involved in mission or serve the church uh, in your own strength. In fact, when you try, man, that's when you fail. That's when you get, that's when you easily get discouraged and then you run away from tough situations. But when we're empowered by the power um, and the joy of the Holy Spirit, that allows us to keep going despite what circumstances we run into. We are called to be spirit Led. That means that as a, as a spirit um, awakens our heart and we become aware of the grace to save us, but he also gives us grace to sustain us um, as we walk out the Christian uh, walk. So, so what that invitation is for us is to be actively seeking the Holy Spirit for guidance, for conviction, for encouragement, um, for evangelistic opportunities, but to, to regularly uh, submit quiet yourself and, and allow the Holy Spirit to lead you through your daily life. Uh, what we want to do is cultivate an environment where we want to acknowledge and celebrate the Holy Spirit's uh, ministry in our lives individually and in our church. And so um, we're going to, throughout the year, we're going to have times of worship and prayer. Uh, uh, and, and again, the goal of that time, and I want to invite you to be a part of it, because the goal of that time is to really cultivate both corporally and individually, corpor uh, cultivate a desire and acknowledgement that, look, Lord, you're leading us. And despite what plans, strategies, hopes we have for us or, or the church, uh, we need you to move. In fact, we don't move until we clearly know you're moving, you're preceding us, you're leading us, and you're guiding us. We must be spirit-led. And then lastly, the value that we really do want to highlight uh, most in this year is the value of being missional. Um, as we are seeking to mobilize missionaries, we see in verse 9, it says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And then verses 11 through 12 says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourner, sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of, your visit, uh, uh, day of visitation. So what that points to is Jesus Christ saved us to send us, to proclaim His excellencies, to live in such a way that outsiders would see how we live for, for God and live for one another and glorify our God in response. That means we are seeking to forsake comfort and convenience to follow Jesus. We, we do not just come here and this is the, the pinnacle, the peak of our existence, but we come together as the gathered church to then leave as the scattered church in our homes, neighborhoods, and jobs to share the glory and good of Jesus Christ. We, we want to see truth and beauty and justice um, holding sway in our city. We want to hold it up as a banner. Like we have people in our church such as Shane Fast that started Rebirth or have you heard of uh, 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 the ministry Mission St. Louis or the Covering House all being birthed from members of the journey, but all with the hope and the goal of pushing back darkness and bringing restoration to the city around us. But even beyond um, ministries of justice, being missional on the, on the justice front, it also includes evangelism, that we are called to share have spiritual conversations with those who are far away. And this is something that, uh, man, I really want our, our, our church to pray for, to pray God to stir our hearts once again for that, to desire to, to, to order our steps and bring people along our path that we can share the gospel with. Uh, we really want to see more people come to know Jesus Christ, um, to see the beauty of the gospel, um, the, the beautiful for wonder that we've experienced in our own lives, we want other people to experience that. And so, in fact, on March 2nd, uh, we'll be having a baptism. Um, I want us as a church to begin praying. Um, and I want to go so far as to challenge you, like, what is, who is one person that you can be praying for now, that you can pray to, to one? Uh, 
invest in relationally, spend more time with, two, that you can engage with the gospel, have a, uh, you know, take uh, uh, steps to have spiritual conversations, and three, that one person that you're going to consistently pray for, not until baptism, but really for the rest of the year, that you're going to consistently pray for that they may come to know the Lord. I am praying that many come to know the Lord through our church. We are called to love our neighbors, our cities, our, our employers, and our fellow co-workers, our fellow students in a way, um, really, that they would see the beauty of Jesus Christ through our lives. And I know some of the issues that, that you know, I know what you're thinking. Well, I don't know what to do, and I don't know how to share the, the gospel. I never did that before. All right, well, well first and foremost, we're, we're going to work towards getting you equipped. And so I know some of you feel ill-equipped. Uh, well, we, we are providing providing evangelism training uh, this year. Uh, we'll do it on a local level at Metro East. Um, you'll be hearing more details about that. But we'll also be having an evangelism conference at our West County Church that's really open to uh, all journey churches, and that's going to be happening in March. But all that with the goal of equipping you to share your faith. But I, I think even really one step further of uh, being feeling ill-equipped. I think some of the issues that I found in my own heart and in, in other people's lives is, um, is an obstacle and an issue that we run into that limits our sharing the gospel um, really is an issue of delighting in Christ, um, that, that we really don't treasure Him, whether it's completely like we've never treasured him or we find ourselves in a season where we're not treasuring him as we should. And, and in light of that reality, we're, we're not sharing him. I mean, we are about us. You're probably like me that when I'm hit that season, I am about me and mine and my issue. I got time to be worried about sharing the gospel with you. I'm trying to fix my own issue. All right. But, but that's not how we're called to be like the gospel going back and the number one value being gospel-centered, the gospel is about believing in him, building our lives uh, on him, but also beholding him as good and precious, as treasuring him above all things. There, uh, C.S. Lewis talks about uh, uh, really what does it look like to, to share um, to share. Uh, praises to God and, and why that is such an important thing um, in, the, in the body of faith, in the life of a Christian. And he says this, he says, I think we delight to praise what we enjoy because the praise not merely expresses what completes the, enjoy me, the enjoyment, it is its appointed consummation. It's not out of compliment that lovers keep on telling one another how beautiful they are. The delight is incomplete till it is expressed. And I feel that that, that sometimes we don't really share the gospel because we're not, we're not treasuring him. We're not delighting ourselves in him as we should. Because if we were, we'd find a way to share. We'll find a way to get equipped. We'll find people to share it with. If we're really delighting in him, that nothing can stop us. If I, if, if I eat good food at a good restaurant, I'm going to tell you about it. If I see a good movie, I'm going to tell you about it. If I hear a good song, I'm going to tell you about it. And if we really experience the goodness of Jesus Christ, hear me, nothing will stop you from sharing about it. And so I'm praying that this year be a year um, that our hearts are stirred for the glory of Jesus Christ, um, that we seek to, to be mobilized missionaries. Regardless of where we're at in our journey of faith, I pray that you jump on board. And I pray um, that it's not just a vision for us to do so that we can be busy Christians, but really that you would find joy in, uh, that your worship will be encouraged, and that your affections will be stirred in. So let me pray for us as we proceed into this year. Lord God, um, we offer ourselves to you, and we ask that when you stir our affections, you point us to the glory of Jesus Christ and the beauty of the cross. You remove any barriers or boundaries or excuses we've used to, to not be missionaries, to not plug in as a family of God, to not behold you as precious, to not serve you, to not be spirit-led. I pray, Lord God, that you do a work in our hearts, do a work in our church. And that I pray that more people come to know you, Lord God, even if they don't even end up at our church. I pray that our end goal is not to build the numbers at the Journey Metro East, but to build the kingdom. And Lord God, I pray that that's what we live for, for your glory, the, the beauty of the kingdom, and the glory of Jesus Christ above all things. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Love you.